Thanks for joining us. My name is Stephanie and I'm a Sustainable Education Officer for Willoughby City Council. Tonight's session is being run in partnership with four other councils, Karingai, Lane Cove, Mossman and North Sydney. It's wonderful that we can come together to share valuable information with our communities. So before getting started, I'd like to acknowledge that wherever we are today, we are all on the lands of Aboriginal traditional owners. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, both past, present and emerging, and thank them for sharing with us their immense knowledge on how to care for this country. So welcome to tonight's webinar. It's the second of four webinars in our Introduction to Sustainable Building series, presented by experts from Renew. Tonight we'll explore how to select and source sustainable building materials. In last month's webinar, we discussed how to design your house or renovations for resilience. If you missed it or would like to watch the recording, we will send a link by email after this session. As councils, we are running these webinars to assist our community to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. We know that as residents, we all have a direct impact on the planet through our homes. Improving our built environment has a significant impact on how we can achieve sustainable living and reduce the energy we use without compromising our comfort. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Martin Frenet. He is a designer, educator, and researcher in the field of sustainable design and architecture. His consultancy develops housing solutions that minimize environmental impacts and maximize resilience to climate change. As well as a PhD from the University of Adelaide, he studied industrial, building, construction, and permaculture design. He is a teaching and research academic at the University of South Australia and a member of the Building Designers Association of Australia. So before leaving you in the knowledgeable hands of Martin, I'll run you through some points on tonight's Zoom webinar. Firstly, this session will last for approximately 90 minutes. Martin will do a presentation for about one hour and then we'll have time for half an hour for some of your questions. Without further ado, I will hand over to Martin. Thank you very much, Stephanie. So here I have just um, a bit of an overview of what's going to be presented tonight. So I want to start with a brief history of construction materials and housing in Australia. Um, talk about the eco impacts of construction materials and the design and construction process. Talk about embodied carbon and embodied energy. Um, an important concept of life cycle assessment and life cycle thinking. And uh, also certification of materials and products. And then also uh, talk about material properties. Just sort of yeah, look at some of the... Um, uh, construction elements in a house and some of the key materials um, and also some um, sort of really ecological materials as well. So um, yeah, uh, I like to start with this slide because uh, it uh, makes us reflect a little bit on where we've um, come from over the um, centuries. And uh, the image on the left of the, the mud huts, um, very um, nicely designed and beautiful mud huts, I would say, it's a good example. Um, I, I guess I'm sort of presenting that as an example of like really um, truly sustainable architecture that I feel could carry on um, for thousands and thousands of years, kind of, kind of no matter what. Um, unless of course climate catastrophe hits us uh which is kind of what what we're trying to address through better design of our houses how can we um avoid the impacts um we are having on our planet um you know, to a large degree this is due to the way we we build our buildings and the way we live in our buildings and so then on the right is the other end of the scale the the mcmansion um which is just sort of a term for a really, um, a really, really large house uh, that uh, I think um, is is the opposite of sustainable. 
and uh, I'll, I'll go into why as we go through. Um, and yeah, sort of, um, yeah, the um, the welcome, oh, sorry, the acknowledgement of the country um, was um, a reminder that, uh, you know, the Indigenous people in Australia lived here for um, a very long time. Some people put it at 60,000 years and um, managed to live on this very um, sort of somewhat inhospitable um, country of ours with the extreme climates. Uh, so that's that's remarkable. And I think we need to uh, keep that in mind at all times. Here's another example from America. And I visited this um, this uh, little village which has been inhabited continuously, they think for you know around roughly 10,000 years. And, and this isn't made out of any fancy modern materials, of course, because it's 10,000 years old and more. Um, it's made out of earth. And so one of the things that I'm really passionate about is, is um, using earth as a construction material. So more, more of that to come. Um, but of course, one of the main strategies uh, throughout the ages has, to, has been to use locally available materials um, whatever's at hand and that was of course because we didn't have um, diesel fueled trucks and uh, global supply chains and uh, and who knows if we'll have them in the future if you fast forward 100 or 200 or a thousand years of course there'll be um, no fossil fuels left um, so uh, yeah you know maybe there'll be a return to this kind of idea of using locally available materials which of course, reduces carbon emissions with those transportation issues of materials. Um, and uh, also, you know, the second dot point there about, um, you know, the idea of being able to refurbish buildings is also um, an interesting um, and important concept rather than tearing things down. Can we just, you know, um, uh, fix things up? And so, yeah, I guess in contrast, 21st century architecture, um, these days we have, um, yeah, all sorts of um, uh, high-tech materials that can be shipped in from the other side of the planet. Um, in this example here, these so-called smart homes um, have home automation, um, circadian lighting systems that are voice controlled, um, but, uh, you know, I'm sort of saying, well, what are the environmental impacts of of this technology, and is that really something everyone can afford and benefit from? Are there even benefits? Um, I mean, of course, there must be some, but um, how is that weighed up against the ecological and environmental impacts? So, yeah, which which approach um, do you think is more sustainable? What is what is true sustainability? <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> and, you know, I think the correct definition is something that we can do indefinitely. So I sort of look at a lot of things that are pitched as sustainable these days in the, in the world of architecture in particular. And uh, I, I just, I think, yeah, they might be sustainable for, <clears throat> let's say, 100 years, but we've also got to think about some of those um, issues I mentioned, like... Um, depletion of resources, you know, fossil fuels, we've, we've used half of them. Um, and it only took us a couple of hundred years to do that, or sorry, about a hundred years to do that. And we're burning through them at a remarkable rate. So um, yeah, where are we going to get all our materials from? Um, uh, many of them are made directly from fossil fuels, um, all our plastic materials that get used quite heavily in modern buildings for waterproofing and what have you. Yeah, I just, I just like, yeah, what do we do when the fossil fuels run out? Um, and also there's that um, transport issue as well. Um, I think we'll no longer be able to move materials across large distances. Yeah, also, I guess the other thing there in the third dot point is our ever increasing population here on planet Earth. I think we're up to about 8 billion and that number's going up, not down. Um, so that's also a really big deal. 
Um, so yeah, what, what materials should we build with given these challenges and what should we build in terms of McMansions or something a little bit more humble perhaps? Uh, yeah, this, this news article is about, um, yeah, our massive houses in Australia. And of course, the kind of obvious issue there is that big houses use more materials and they use more energy to heat and cool. So if we can be a little bit more sensible um, and look to other countries, Europe, Japan, where people seem to live happily in much smaller buildings, um, then I, I think we could learn from those other cultures. Uh, and yeah, another example of, uh, <laughs> I guess again, that far end of the spectrum. Um, and these, these, um, these construction methods are um, sort of um, being revived, which I think is great. It'd be a real pity to lose um, lose the knowledge of how to do this. So yeah, this this article is about um, indigenous people sort of um, you know continuing to build in this way. Uh, and yeah, contrasting the bark hut with um, you know some uh, you know relatively modern um, material. Um, yeah, uh, I guess I don't need to talk too much about asbestos, but um, yeah, we can we can get this materials thing really terribly wrong. Um, here's another example of where we've got it really terribly wrong uh, in in the in the quite recently uh, flammable cladding, and then the the very latest is um, the engineered stone countertops, which are causing silicosis. Um, uh, reminiscent of the asbestos problem. So um, yeah, let's let's make some sensible decisions about what we put in our buildings. Um, and hopefully by the end of tonight's presentation, uh, that will all be a little bit uh, clearer. Uh, so manufacturing materials. Um, first, we have to, um, uh, yeah, kind of, um, make these materials. So I'm sort of going to step through some of the, um, go right back to the beginning of how we make materials and then transform them into construction materials. So we've kind of got the raw materials and they get turned into construction materials. Um, and uh, yeah, designers, architects, engineers, builders, and homeowners are all making really important decisions about the type of materials and where they're located in the building and how they're assembled and hopefully one day disassembled at the end of the building's life. Um, and yeah, these decisions do have massive impacts on the performance in terms of generally thermal performance, how much heating and cooling energy is needed, and of course the cost to build the home. Uh, and yeah, I'll be talking about the ecological impacts as well. Uh, so in uh, this slide here, um, yeah, Basically, uh, sort of, we sort of figured out how to make buildings more energy efficient. We're getting a lot better than, with that, with um, correct orientation, insulation, thermal mass, draft proofing, double glazing, and this reduces the operational energy. Um, but the next big challenge is the embodied energy, and increasingly, um, this is becoming a um, a thing that's being focused on um, with. Uh, uh, even rating schemes are starting to take this into account. Um, so yeah, in the future, increasingly designers are going to have to be thinking about embodied energy of the materials they're specifying because yeah, we, ha we have to get that carbon footprint of the construction stage down as well. And also the end of life stage, which is something that is almost always ignored, um, I feel, um, by uh, designers and architects that they, they get, yeah, they're really good at operational energy reduction, starting to think about embodied energy. But when it comes to what happens to the building at the end of its life, it's generally not uh, a big concern. And so the last dot point is, um, yeah, about how that end of life stage can feed into what's now known as a circular economy, um, where we use those materials, um, in in a, in a new building or in some other I don't know some other part of our built environment maybe it's um, an example would be crushing up bricks in concrete and putting it in roads or something like that uh, yeah and um, 
yeah, in this in this report, um, it's predicted that embodied carbon, so the carbon embodied in our buildings, all the embodied carbon and materials, and the labour and the transport, um, will account for eighty five percent of Australia's built environment in twenty fifty. And this is at a time when we're trying to get to net zero. So um, yeah, this is a big challenge for us. So uh, sustainable material properties. Um, if we're going to reduce carbon pollution and other ecological impacts, um, then future homes must be energy efficient in all the life cycle stages. So um, sort of been talking about this for the last few slides. Raw material manufacture is the first stage. Two is construction on site. Three is operation throughout the life of the building, which could be, you know, 50, maybe 100 years would be great if we could get 100 years out of a residential home. And I would like to think definitely out of commercial buildings, but sadly that's not the case. Um, and of course, the end of life disposal or upcycling, hopefully, or recycling at the end of the building's life. And then at all these stages, there are there's transport going on with with um, you know trucking, freight, all that kind of stuff. And so yeah, there are there are examples of um, moves to tackle this with things like electric trucks. And I've already mentioned the idea of sourcing local materials. We also need to think about toxicity and safety, durability and longevity, um, repair and maintenance upgradable and transformable designs, um, how we minimize waste, um, environmental impacts to land, water, soil, and air. It's not just carbon emissions. It's sort of like there's all sorts of other things like deforestation and um, you know pollution of waterways. Um, and can we recycle upcycle instead of mining or deforestation for virgin materials? A really important thing to understand is that materials and costs are locked in at the design stage. So this is really a great time to be thinking really hard about, I mean, I've already given you that fundamental issue of the size of the building and Australians' propensity to build massive houses. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, that's some low-hanging fruit right there, the size of the floor plan. Um, but of course, then it's like, well, what are these walls made out of and floor, roof, et cetera? So, yeah, it's a um, it's a long and winding process. And uh, but it all starts with um, that um, brief at the beginning to the designer. And so this is where, um, you know, briefing your architect or building designer on um Maybe saying, look, you know, we're interested in, uh, you know, an energy, uh, sorry, a, a space efficient design and uh, really keen to uh, use some more ecological materials. And of course, let's have a very um, uh, thermally efficient building. I mean, I guess, I guess what I'd say a bit further is um, kind of trust your designer. They'll have some ideas. Part of their job is to educate um, clients as to you know what are the more sustainable choices and, and um, of course the client always has some some firm ideas about what materials they want to use but um, <clears throat> be open to um, new suggestions and new possibilities uh, so uh, yeah that was a little bit about the relationship between the designer and the architect uh, sorry the designer architect and client um, another real um, key player um, who can dramatically influence like cost and material selection is the structural engineer. Uh, and uh, yeah, I guess also um, working with them early in the process can avoid some uh, unforeseen issues with things like, um, you know, footings in reactive clay soils. And, um, you know, if the, if the design is, a, is, doesn't take into account structural engineering, you know, roof structures and all this can tend to need over-engineering and, um, you know, very heavy beams or what have you, cranes are needed to erect things. And so, you know, this all adds to the cost and the eco impacts as well. 
Um, then of course there's the builder and um, their, their role um, or the way they impact all this is that they're um, they kind of controlling um, how much materials are brought to site and how much gets wasted uh, in that construction process. So um, yeah, having a builder who's got the right attitude um, is also um, important. And then, yes, I've already spoken about this. Um, how do we do a little bit better than the mess you see here? So choosing materials, there are many considerations, including, of course, probably at the top of many clients list is the, um, is the aesthetics or beauty of the material, which of course is important. You've got to love, um, you know, the home you live in and um, feel good about um, or, or like looking at, at the finishes. Another one right at the top of the list is cost. Um, but what about availability? And we sort of got hit with this a little bit during COVID and it's still a bit of an issue. Um, maintenance, serviceability of materials. Some are better than others or easier than others to maintain. Uh, and that's directly related to the next one, durability, longevity, resilience against things like the weather is the obvious one, but also bushfires, termites, condensation and mold. These things are all sort of evolving issues. For example, in Tasmania, massive problems with mold and condensation in that, in that wetter climate. Um, uh, of course, energy issues, um, embodied and operational energy. You know, how do these materials affect the, the, um, the thermal performance, the heating and cooling energy of the home? And the sustainability, envir environmental impact and ecological footprint is also another consideration, um, which is sadly often the last thing people think about. Um, so, um, Moving on to life cycle thinking. Um, this is where you think about, um, yeah, all those all those stages that I've been talking about from the raw materials through the operation of building, um, through the demolition of the building. If you're not thinking about those, those stages, then your decisions are probably um, gonna end up being um, bad for the environment and lead to more carbon emissions and potentially more costs as well. If we take that example of maintenance um, and bushfires and things like that. So, um, yep, there's the there's an image of those life cycles um, and uh, yep, where the, where the energy is, um, is uh, expanded. And then, yeah, the circular economy is that idea that we turn this into a, a closed loop so that the materials, yeah, they, they get cycled. They don't end up in landfill. That's really the, the end goal here is let's not send so much stuff to landfill. So um, taking the example of timber here, um, the raw material is a tree. And of course we need land, sun, water, fertilizer, and diesel and workers to make this and um, kind of take all that for granted, I think. But as I've sort of painted a bit of a picture, um, climate change and, you know, resource scarcity, fossil fuel de depletion, that, that threatens even the humble um, stick of timber could get hard to grow the trees um, with uh, unpredictable climates and what have you. So in Australia, it often starts with logging an old growth forest um, or a plantation. And so again, there's a choice. Do you, do you get old growth forest timber or do you get it from a plantation? Um, and even plant, I mean, the plantation sounds like the sustainable option to me, but even, even they have, um, environmental impacts. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's, there's, ne there's often never a really clear answer. Uh, and so, yeah, de deforestation, um, hopefully it's obvious that that's, um, you know, uh, has, has huge environmental impacts. Um, and so, you know, Social issues, of course, there's a lot of angry people um, uh, who, who rally and protest against um, uh, knocking down our ancient forests. And um, yeah, scenes like this um, kind of um, 
Uh, it's to me that's very obviously not sustainable to be chopping down these massive trees that took hundreds of years to grow. That it just obviously cannot continue. Um, and um, yeah, you know, I'm just giving you a bit of an idea of all the all the processes that you know take energy. It takes energy to you know dry the timber and um, you know. Um, you know, this kiln kiln drying very energy intensive, whereas air drying, you know. So again, these these are all decisions you might have to make um, as a new homeowner. Are we going to get kiln dried timber or air dried timber, or are we going to get solar kiln dried timber, which probably isn't commercially available? It's probably the kind of thing you DIY. Um, the material's got to be stored in a warehouse, which takes environmental impacts. And then, as I've mentioned before, it's got to be transported to site. And this, thankfully, you might notice here, it says this vehicle is 100% electric, zero emissions. So um, isn't that great? Um, we are starting to head in new, more sustainable, maybe not totally sustainable, but more sustainable directions. And then, yeah, waste on site is something that hopefully we can um, really reduce. And yeah, this example here, the timber waste, Hopefully that can be, um, instead of landfill, maybe that can be uh, maybe used as a fuel or um, turned into something like, um, you know, like a particle board or something like that. And then, of course, um, sort of to complete this little discussion about timber, um, then, you know, you've got to be thinking about the finishes and maintenance, the ongoing um, costs and labour uh, and frequency of how often you have to do this is all um, important thinking to be done. And yes, as I've already mentioned, is there a smarter way to do the end of life stage demolition? Um, yeah, what happens with those materials? Um, and here's an example of uh, a building that's been designed for disassembly and reuse. Um, so it could be easily relocated and you don't have to call in the, um, the wrecking ball. Uh, salvaging materials is an interesting one. It's, um, it's actually not as easy and inexpensive as it sounds. This is something I I've tried to do with my home and, um, and, uh, some, uh, other projects for clients. And, uh, I mean, perhaps, perhaps the, um, yeah, it's some of the issues there as is it just sort of complicates design and engineering when you're working with, um, materials that have been salvaged, um, going back to the example of timber, uh, you know, you may even have to get that salvaged timber um, sort of specially certified. So we know the strength grade of it. Um, and uh, the other example there is um, uh, if, if the salvaged windows or doors you've got aren't made from the right species of timber, then it might not be the right um, species if you're building in a bushfire zone. Um, so then you can't use these things that you've salvaged. So you really got to do your homework on some of this stuff and brief your engineer and designer so they know what they've got to incorporate into design. And one last thing would be you got to store these things. Like you, you need storage. Um, so um, yeah, look, it's it may not be the cheap option. Hate to say it because I do love the idea, but um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so embodied energy, um, energy use is the energy used to manufacture something and embodied carbon is the um, carbon emissions resulting from the embodied energy. And uh, it's good to have a bit of an idea um, of what, um, what materials are high in embodied energy, what materials are low. Um, <clears throat> And uh, this, this little example here on the right is from the yourhome.gov.au website, which is a fantastic website that I refer everyone to. The, the link is down there. Maybe, Doug, you could chuck that in the, in the chat or something. Um, but, yeah, you can see the aluminium um, with 358 megajoules per kilogram is one of the real... Um, one of the highest uh, in embodied energy. So beware of aluminium. 
thankfully we tend to use it i mean it's it's it, it's great because it's very lightweight so a kilogram of aluminium versus a kilogram of steel you um you, you're not going to need as much aluminium um because it's just so lightweight and strong compared to yeah, other materials so you don't tend to use a large quantity of it um, and it tends to get used in buildings for window frames so that may be excusable and perhaps quite a good idea um but um yeah it's uh it's 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 just a, an issue to be aware of. Um, uh, so moving right along, um, here again from the Your Home website. Um, now we're talking about like wall assemblies. Um, so it says embodied energy for assembled walls, and um, the highest one on that list is here down the bottom, which is a single skin autoclaved aerated concrete block wall with plasterboard lining and curiously maybe it comes as a bit of a surprise uh, a polystyrene wall on a timber frame has the lowest embodied energy and i would i would hazard a guess that it would also have you know i mean it's hard to judge here but um you know, polystyrene does have really good insulative properties, whereas an autoclaved aerated concrete block wall um, perhaps doesn't measure up quite as well with the insulative performance. But I'm, I'm, I mean, without more details about these this data here, that's hard to say. But um, these are some of the thoughts that go through my mind when you know I'm thinking about um, you know what is what is a good wall assembly to use. Um, We've got to think about this embodied energy, yes, but also um, we've got to think about um, thermal performance and are these are these materials the right materials in you know for the for the climate for the orientation of the building and all that kind of thing. Um, so life cycle assessment is a bit of an attempt to measure um, some of these. Um, you know, measure this embodied energy and the embodied carbon arising from it. And uh, I love this saying, if you can't measure it, you can't control it. So this is all about actually measuring or estimating what we think the, what the, um, what the life cycle impacts throughout the construct use, end of use and production stages are. And an important concept here is the functional unit. So this is to really ensure that we're comparing apples with apples. And that example I just gave about comparing two wall assemblies, the polystyrene one versus the concrete block, we can't really do a good comparison unless we're comparing um, wall assemblies that have the same R value would be top of my list is like, you know, if, if the insulative value is the same, then we're making a fair comparison because then we can perhaps expect similar thermal performance, um, which is, um, you know, then going to lead to um, similar heating and cooling energy. So, um, yeah, th thinking about um, how we make these comparisons is really important. So there's a there's an online tool called um, Circlos, um, used to be called eTool, um, and there's um, there's more sophisticated sorry sophisticated ones called Sema Pro and Gabby. Um, there are also online databases similar to the one I showed you previously for the embodied energy that um, that lists um, you know for example this one's listing embodied water. Um, embodied greenhouse gas emissions. So this is the carbon um, carbon emissions, and we've also got the embodied energy in megajoules. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a um, there's a URL there. You can probably just Google um, Epic database um, if you're interested in that. Um, then there's the idea of certification and like, you know, really proving to consumers that um, these materials have gone through this rigorous life cycle assessment um, process and you can be confident that what you're buying is actually greener, um, more ecological than um, one of the alternate alternatives.
So Global Green Tag is a, um, is a certification scheme. Um, and there's others like the um, Forest Stewardship Council, the um, Good Environmental Choice Australia. Um, these are sort of things to look out for. Don't just, don't get conned by, um, you know, people claiming that things are ecological when perhaps um, they haven't really gone through this rigorous process. And I think in future, more and more manufacturers will be doing that. Um, so construction material systems, systems is in uppercase because it's really important that you do think of all these interacting parts in the building as, um, as systems. So typically we have a floor system, a wall system, a roof system. Um, and these are there to achieve certain performance requirements, which is actually a technical term from the National Construction Code, which will, you know, in the example of the roof here, it's got to be waterproof, it's got to be energy efficient, it's got to be structurally sound, termite resistant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, um, yeah, if you don't, if you don't sort of take this, um, systems, um, view of things and, and consider how all these materials that are touching each other, often it's because they're touching each other. Like one might react with another and it might cause early failure or something like that. So this is where, um, yeah, talking to your designer or architect and builder, they, they kind of know the pitfalls here yeah i mean i think one really important point is that everything has its pros and cons um there's sort of no perfect building material um and so the example i give here is that um uh, i know a lot of people contact me very you know wanting an eco home and they're very excited about hempcrete because hemp is a renewable crop um, with minimal pesticide and fertilizer requirements, and it's got really good insulated properties. It can look really beautiful. Um, but on the downside, um, hemp is coated um, in a, or hempcrete is, um, hemp is coated in a lime binder to, that glues it all together. And lime, like cement, has significant global warming potential and, and also safety issues for the workers. Um, so, um, yeah, there's just no perfect material. It's all it's always pros and cons. And so um, some of the research I did as part of my um, PhD was looking at wall construction systems. And so here you see uh, a, a sort of a, a, a slice, like one meter length of um, a rammed earth wall. And so again, with this systems thinking, it's like you can't just look at the wall. You've actually got to look at, you can see at the bottom, you know, I thought about, well, you know, what, what's the, how much concrete do we have to put under a rammed earth wall and what, what needs to go on top of the wall and within the wall um, to, to make it structurally sound. So this is that systems thinking. And then, yeah, I, through this process, I then calculated the mass of, um, you know, there's, there's about 1.6 ton of rammed earth in a meter of wall. And then there's also some um, some uh, plastic sheet for damp proofing. And there's a little bit of concrete, 420 kilograms for the footing, et cetera, et cetera. And then this then translates into, um, uh, this, this all translates into um, the carbon impacts. Um, and so, yeah, I went through this process with, um, sorry, just going back one, brick veneer wall. I looked at all sorts of walls. Um, and um, this is a graph showing um, a whole range of different wall constructions. This one labeled MB is mud brick. That was actually had the lowest um, global warming potential, um, carbon emissions um, out of all the wall constructions I looked at. Uh, and the biggest impact to the purple part is from the footing. Um, you know, not surprisingly, in all the walls I looked at, the, the footing um, is. Uh, or in many of the walls, um, the footing is a big deal. Um, that concrete leads to some heavy carbon emissions. So uh, yeah, just there comparing brick veneer, fairly common with the rammed earth, which you can see is um, 
um, substantially less. So I guess I'm saying, you know, if we move to things like rammed earth, that can be a, a big game changer at large scale. Um, and then, yeah, here I've sort of looked um, now at all the other impacts like ozone depletion, um, photochemical oxidation is smog, you know, polluted air, eutrophication is polluted water, land use, water use, solid waste, landfill, um, embodied energy. Um, this is just sort of sort of showing you where all those impacts are as well for all these different wall constructions. And again, mud brick is is looking really good. This is SB is straw bale. Um, and uh, right down the end here, we've got insulated concrete block. Not so good. Um, so, um, yeah, there's the round earth and brick veneer again. Uh, and, you know, the interesting thing about this is here we're looking at all the eco impacts, not just the carbon. It's it's those other issues as well. Like there's a lot of talk these days about carbon. It's the carbon. But what about, yeah, things like um, deforestation and, and polluted waterways? Um, I'm just going to skip over a few of them. I've got my eye on the time. Um, so um, another part of my research was um, I was really interested in off-grid housing and um, I, I kind of wanted to um, understand more clearly what the eco impacts of um, going off-grid with things like batteries and solar panels, a little bit of gas for backup um, compared to the electricity grid. And I compared it to the, I'm in South Australia, I compared it to the South Australian energy grid, which actually is quite a green grid because it's got quite a bit of, um, uh, quite a bit of uh, wind in it. Um, very occasionally we're powered 100% by wind here in South Australia. Um, and so I was sort of happy to find out that, because um, uh, I was concerned about, you know, batteries, you know, recycling of batteries and solar panels and all the, all the heavy metals that go into making batteries, things like lead and lithium. Um, here I modeled a lead, lead acid battery. Um, and it turns out to be, you know, substantially better than hooking up to the grid in terms of um, ecological impact. I found um, the same thing with the water supply, um, but here it's much more dramatic, like just so much better to have, you know, a pump, rainwater tank, some filters, um, to supply drinkable water compared to these, you know, um, very uh, material and energy intensive, you know, this, you can see here this power, uh, sorry, this water um, treatment facility um, is, is a big deal in terms of concrete and people who make that thing work and all the chemicals and energy that goes into just making sure when you turn on the tap, you've got clean water to drink and it's a similar story with the wastewater um uh you know off-grid systems that you know recycle the water for um for growing plants is a terrific idea um flushing our poo out into the ocean after it's had a bit of treatment is not such a great idea okay and so now um Bit of a look at um, some of those, um, some of the key materials. Timber is a big one, of course. Um, and some questions are like, you know, what tree species is best in a given application and climate? Might be totally different what you make your windows um, as, a pair, as opposed to your, um, you know, your roof beams or something. Where does it come from? Plantation or is it selectively harvested um, sustainably from a forest? Is it certified? Um, uh, what are the best, you know, manufacturing processes? Um, what are the best products for staining, painting, finishing, preserving the timber? Um, how do I dispose of it at the end of life? Um, and yeah, is there any toxicity from termite treatments? Hopefully you all know you should not burn um, permapine or the, you know, the blue timber, um, the termite treated timber, because that that re releases, um, you know, carcinogenic um, stuff. Um, even things like the soaring patterns, the way the timber's chopped up can um, affect the sustainability. Um, yeah, this is what I just mentioned about um, the uh, copper chrome and arsenate um, termite treatment. Um, 
uh, yeah, you know, is it better to use this stuff or is it better to use this with um, some sort of termite barrier, um, you know, at the slab level? Um, and th there's, there's kind of no clear answer on some of these things. Um, this is where you might need to, you know, look at one of those online, um, you know, get a consultant to um, use some of that online software uh, I mentioned that can actually answer some of these questions. Um, yeah, so you can see there's just a huge range of, um, of, of options when it comes to, to timber. Um, and uh, yeah, there's just no, there's no standardized way of evaluating these things. And it's, it is actually really difficult to compare. So um, concrete, um, some quick facts. It's, um, yeah, I'm always trying to reduce the amount of concrete in my designs, but the engineers, of course, really like it because it is a really well understood, well studied and um, yeah, it's, it's just, I mean, it's easy to get as well. Um, very highly available. It is very durable. Um, it does suffer from um, the potential problem of concrete cancer, which is where the reinforcing bar um, rusts um, if, it's, if it's exposed um, to the weather. Um, and also it's really heavy, um, heavy stuff. So um, there's comparatively high embodied energy and eco impacts because it's just the sheer mass of it. Um, so yeah, concrete also tends to get um, down cycled, meaning it just ends up as, you know, maybe something that gets crushed and goes into roads. Whereas things like um, steel is um, highly recyclable and aluminium is the same. Um, yeah, timber, only a very small amount gets recycled. Um, a lot of it gets landfilled. So these are also things to, have in mind when it comes to um, yeah how do we how do we minimize waste? Um, so yeah, steel and aluminium and plastic. Um, I'm gonna skip over them. Natural materials. Um, uh, yeah, I've I've I gave you that example right at the beginning of the um, the urban architecture. This is kind of my passion. Um, and yeah, I feel like it is a bit of a missed opportunity. Uh, and I think in the future, you'll see more and more examples of rammed earth, which can be, um, you know, really decorative and beautiful or, or not. Um, there are complete cities, um, that are made, um, um, in the middle East out of, um, out of earth and they've, they've lasted hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, straw is a really, um, has great potential. Uh, it's a, it's just a waste product from agriculture, from our food production system. And there, there are products like, um, Dara wall or Jura wall panel, um, uh, the ceiling panel by Solomit. Um, uh, these, um, you know, I'm confident in saying have really good environmental credentials and, um, in and yeah, also other benefits like improved insulation. And uh, yeah, with the, the Jura panel, there's all sorts of different um, finishes you can get on, the, on that, that straw panel. Um, and um, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of information there about um, some of the costs per square meter. It's kind of a good exercise to go through, I think, as an architect or designer, or even as a, um, as a potential homeowner to sort of just go again, it's that functional units. Like how do we compare? Let's look at one square meter, see what the cost is per square meter. And that will give us a, something of an idea about, um, yeah, how, how we can compare it to other alternatives. Um, and um, another favorite of mine is straw bale walls. And um, there's some, um, information on these uh, on the Your Home um, website. And they do have phenomenal insulative value. Um, I guess the downside as I've listed down here is they're quite, they're quite wide walls, uh, about half a meter thick and 
that takes up valuable floor space, especially in a suburban context. So maybe maybe that's where something like um, hempcrete or just you know um, uh, a stud wall with extra insulation in it um, could be a, a better choice if you push for space. Um, my other passion is building with uh, car tires. So my my company name is Earthship Eco Homes, and Earthships are renowned for turning car tires into um, into walls. And um, you know the artist's impression here of um, all the tires that we um, we generate in Australia every every year from driving about. And uh, that that number is going up, not down. It'll be you know up to sixty million soon. Um, and yeah, I go collect them and um, and build them into walls. And so what you see in the image down here is a tire wall rendered with earth. And the, the thing I really love about these walls is that we're taking a waste material and turning it into an amazing construction material that's actually earthquake and bushfire resilient. Um, once you've got a coat of render on these tire walls, um, the they're um, protected from bushfire and also with mound earth against them. So they're protected by a huge mound of earth, which gives thermal benefits to the building as well, helping it stay at a nice stable temperature. Um, and we're just, we're filling them with earth and coating them with earth. So earth is, earth is probably the ultimate sustainable material if it's used in the right way. Um, and so I've actually done some, um, research um, through the uni and with tire stewardship sponsoring us to test the earthquake resilience and the strength of these walls and what we found was that it was yeah these walls would be amazing in an earthquake um so um another another um quite sustainable material i think has got great potential is this weather text which is made from compressed wood fiber with a wax additive to kind of glue it all together. It's termite and mold resistant, comes in large sheets in a range of sizes and groove patterns. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, they've gone through some certification processes to demonstrate its sustainability. It's about the right price. So yeah, that, that could also be, and this is, this is actually becoming quite a conventional thing. You can buy it at Bunnings. So, you know, it must be, it must be quite conventional these days. And so, yeah, here are some of their environmental claims. Um, and uh, yeah, that's um, quite a good product, I think. I've already talked a little bit about the pros and cons of salvaging. Um, so again, yes, yeah, some information about, um, you know, costs per square meter. So you can compare it to other materials per square meter. Um, OSB oriented strand board tends to get used for bracing in walls, but you can also just leave it exposed. And some people like the look of that. That's um, as you can see, fairly, fairly cheap compared to the others. So if we're thinking affordable housing, um, which is of course is another really huge part of this discussion that I'm not really going into tonight, but you know, affordability is, is a massive issue in Australia in the middle of a housing crisis right now. Uh, um and uh plywood um yep again look out for the um the uh certification um also think about off gassing sometimes the glues they use aren't so great so you know healthy indoor air quality is also another issue um you know toxicity of materials um uh, steel is also, you know, a potential cladding material. I'm sort of going through a whole lot of cladding materials at the moment or lining materials for inside or outside the building. Just so you sort of start getting a sense of all the options that are available and the, and the pros and cons of some of these things. Um, so, uh, yeah, energy efficiency, um, obviously a huge issue. Um, climate zones. Um, there's eight in the National Construction Code. There's actually um, 69 different um, uh, regions that are used for the, um, the NATHERS Energy Assessment, the Nationwide um, Home Energy Rating Scheme. Um, sorry, House Energy Rating Scheme, which, of course, 
in a lot of states, they've now gone from six stars to um, seven stars. So we're ratcheting up um, things like what's the minimum R value you can have in your walls. And, um, and yeah, again, you know, this is info from the Your Home website um, that shows that, you know, an uninsulated brick veneer wall R0.45 doesn't, doesn't meet some of those minimum requirements. So how do you how do you get that R value up? It's all about you know, well it's not all about, but one of the key concepts is the R value of your roof um, and walls, and even perhaps your floor might have some subfloor insulation or some edge slab edge insulation. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of this info is coming from the Your Home website. Definitely refer you to to Your Home once again. Um, here you can see that slab edge insulation, which stops heat conduction out the side of your slab into the earth around it. Um, uh, slab heating is um, quite an energy efficient way to do things because you're warming up that thermal mass of the concrete slab and that, that heat rises up into the air and it sort of tends to hold the heat as well for a long time. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, refer to the National Construction Code for some of these minimum um, minimum R values uh, and also issues like roof color is even an issue. Um, and so again, in the National Construction Code, NCC volume two, um, the um, like a light, a light colored roof or wall is gonna give you a better um, energy efficiency assessment um, because it's more reflective. Um, although some, some councils don't like um, these light colors because they are reflective. So there's also these kind of planning and aesthetic issues as well. Um, and you, you'll see these values in the color bond you know, chart that lists all those um, solar absorptance values. Um, yes, that's the point I just made. Um, so yeah, insulation, of course, very important, slows down the flow of heat. Um, heat flows from hot to cold and it's measured with the R value or the U value as well. Um, U value is just the inverse of the R value. So just divide the R value by one and get the U value. So that's just a bit of a confusing thing. Don't know why we, we chop and change between those two um, ways of measuring things, but here's a bit of a table just sort of um, looking at looking at our value. So again, you can compare. So as a building designer, I, I kind of love these kind of charts where I can really clearly compare for a given thickness of material. I can compare the R value. Um, yeah. Uh, also, yeah, then we've got metric and imperial. So sometimes you'll see stuff on the internet um, about um, American values, which tend to be, um, you know, a lot more, about six times more than our um, metric values we use in Australia. And so just on this topic of, yeah, like insulation and um, thermal mass, these are the two things that regulate the energy efficiency in a building. And uh, it hasn't really been the focus of this talk, but, um, you know, those materials um, that you select do have a real impact on energy efficiency. So here I'm sort of looking at materials of walls and um, how that leads to more energy efficient buildings. Um, I was also looking at this earthship concept of the greenhouse or the sunroom on the north sunny side of the building and how what you'll notice here is when you add a greenhouse to a given floor plan, um, passive solar design floor plan, you always end up with less energy use because that greenhouse is, a, is great at capturing free solar energy in the winter. And if you design it right, that's not going to be um, bad in the summer. So, um, yeah, then we've got insulation installation. You know, really important to install that stuff correctly with no gaps. <clears throat> um, Bondor is a really interesting insulative product. Um, it's a structural insulated panel, um, basically polystyrene with um, the, the metal skin laminated to each side. And this can actually um, overcome the need to have structural elements in the roof. It's so strong as a sandwich panel, you don't need to do the usual roofing structure. 
sarking membranes and wraps are really important um, material um, in your roofing system and also wall systems and the German passive house concept, which is taking Australia by storm, is um, really heavily reliant on these um, vapor permeable um, um, plastic based sucking or membrane systems. Um, and you really got to get this stuff right. Otherwise, you can end up with um, condensation issues. Um, so, yeah, this idea that um, moisture in the air can like move through but you know if it rains on the roof while it's been constructed the rain actually can't get in but vapor from inside the building once the building's finished it's from things like cooking and breathing and doing laundry that moisture can escape through the vapor permeable wall and roof wrap um windows of course are a really big big deal and so you know think always think of them like a system don't just think about the glazing think about the frame as well um and also really important is where you put those windows so um and how and how you shade the windows um to let the sun in when you want it in in the winter and keep the sun out when you don't want to to come in in the summer um but um yeah that's not the focus of tonight's presentation um the example here is one of my earthship designs where basically all the glazing is to the north where arguably that's really the only place you should ever put a window in a building if you want it to be really energy efficient um so yeah here are some shading diagrams showing how sun comes into a building at uh, different times of year hopefully your architect and designer can show you shading diagrams like this. Um, there's all sorts of different types of glass um, with different coatings to maybe keep out unwanted Western summer sun in the late afternoon, toughened glass for bushfire uh, applications. Um, there's just a whole world could talk about that for quite a while, all the options you've got there. Um, double glazing, even triple glazing, even quadruple glazing in Europe. Um, this is all gonna make your home more energy efficient, but also cost more. So these things have to be balanced. Um, some of the key measures are things like U-value, solar heat gain coefficient, how much light actually comes through the glass, all these things um, need to be considered. Um, and your energy assessment report will basically tell you what what values you've got to achieve there. So a couple of examples there of some energy assessment reports. Um, you, all this data is available online. You can then sort of find what type of glazing is appropriate. Uh, I've mentioned the window frame material and um, the important thing to understand there is that heat will pass in and out and aluminium tends to be bad because it's so conductive. So you might have lovely double glazing, but then you've got all this energy passing in and out through the aluminium, and then that gets cold in the winter and you get condensation and then you start getting mold. Um, already talked about U-value. There's a thing called WERS, which is the Window Energy Rating Scheme. So you can go to wurslink.com.au and that lists a whole lot of manufacturers and the values of their windows. Um, and then there's also, um, yeah, like a, a um, an association um, um, for windows um, that you might like to um, see if your supplier is accredited by them. Uh, also windows and doors, big deal with bushfires. So if you're building in a bushfire zone, make sure you do your homework on um, the bushfire code. Uh, yeah, so um, one, of, one of the issues, all these standards are hidden behind a paywall. So, um, um, but yeah, the Australian Glass and Window Association have a good guide to the bush, bushfire code um, standards so you don't have to pay for it. So in conclusion, um, make sure you brief your designer or your architect on what types of materials you like and what's your philosophy on environmentalism? Because um, everyone's got a different view of that. Um, and then let your... Um, designer take it from there they'll develop a range of options for you to consider and you'll just work collaboratively collaboratively to um, work out what 
suits your budget and any other constraints there might be imposed by the materials themselves, such as availability, um, I don't know, structural engineering issues, that kind of thing. So um, it's question time. Thanks for your attention, everyone. Great. Thanks, Martin. There was lots of interesting information there, lots to digest. Uh, we do have quite a few questions here uh, in the Q&A. Firstly, I guess um, seems to be a bit of a common theme is, um, so what kind of modern building materials would you recommend if you were building in like the area that, you know, our councils are in? So well, the, I guess, yeah, to think about the structure, the, the, the typical approach is you put down a concrete slab and um, and then you build you build either a timber or a steel frame. And so I think um, both of those pro approaches, as I've said, have their have their pros and cons. You know, the steel is um, high in embodied energy but highly recyclable. Um, termite resistant, whereas the timber, um, yeah, that's that's better in terms of the embodied energy, but it's not as recyclable. It tends to end up in landfill. It's got those issues with termites, and so then you're using other products to deal with the termites. So um, I think maybe maybe a good approach is um, figure out. Um, who you want to build with and each builder will have their, their way of working. And then, you know, if, if they're working with the materials they're used to, then that's going to minimize waste and minimize expense. Um, I think, um, I mean, probably the, the really important thing is if you think about the life cycle thing, again, it's like during operation of the building, which hopefully is 50 to a hundred years. Um, I think, you know, often, buildings these days are lucky to last 25 or 30 years. Um, there's, you know, that ongoing energy use throughout 50 to hundred years really adds up. So putting more insulation into the building and putting thermal mass into the building. Um, so it can sort of store energy, store thermal energy overnight. So, you know, the idea of um, storing um you know daytime energy storing that overnight in some thermal mass like some internal brick walls or an internal rammed earth wall um uh is is with a well insulated um perimeter you know envelope to the building well insulated walls well insulated roof um that that's really the um the uh the basic um blueprint for success is, um, yeah, let's reduce the um, the operational energy for heating and cooling by having this energy efficient, um, well insulated um, building. And so the the passive house approach is to seal up the building really tight with these vapor permeable wraps, and then there's a what's called a heat recovery um, uh, ventilation system which is a, basically a very efficient way of bringing outside air into the building, getting the inside air out. And as the air passes, um, there's a heat exchange. So you're not sort of wasting energy um, as you're moving air from inside to outside the building. So that's the German passive house approach. Um, I like to think of it as like an esky. It's like really tight, really well insulated. Um, and you're moving that air in and out with um, a mechanical system. And yeah, of course, really good insulation. Whereas um, the, the passive solar design approach, and it's confusing because we've got passive house and passive solar, the more kind of, I suppose, um, ancient method um, is to you know try and face the sun to uh, sorry face the building to the sun with most of the glazing to the north, um, double glazing, um, and then trying to heat up thermal mass inside the building. So the floor, the concrete floor, is a good example of thermal mass. Getting the sun to heat up that thermal mass. Um, so this is maybe where there's an advantage with a passive solid home. You don't want to have a timber floor 
So the concrete floor is that thermal mass that's going to store that thermal energy overnight and keep your building at a better temperature overnight because it's it's providing that um, regulation of the indoor temperature because this the thermal mass has this property of um, uh, sort of trying to um, even out the peaks and troughs in the indoor um, temperature because it's sort of storing that thermal energy and releasing it as the air temperature drops down or it absorbs it as the air temperature increases. So I'd say they're kind of the two main approaches and each has sort of a palette of materials that goes with it. Um, so you sort of have to sort of go, well, what's, what's my approach to um, designing a, a sustainable energy efficient home? Let's get that energy efficiency thing right. That's kind of, I'd, I'd argue, the number one thing to get right is you don't want to be paying a lot of money for heating and cooling. Once you've got that um, strategy, then you go, all right, so what are the materials that um, make sense for that type of um, energy efficiency strategy? How can we reduce the embodied energy? So, I mean, yeah, like I, I know I would have probably confused a lot of people this evening because there's just so many options and it's mm. not clear yet. And this is sort of the unhappy reality for us at the moment is that it's not easy to sort of go into Bunnings and make a clear choice between um, insulation products because they don't have the, the green labels, the certification schemes on them yet. That will be coming one day, hopefully soon, with better government regulation and all that kind of stuff that forces manufacturers to put this information on their products, forces them to go through that life cycle assessment process. And then, then you start to go, oh, okay, I can make some sensible decisions, but... At the moment, it's it's not always clear. Um, and, you know, the example I gave of the timber, it's like, you know, one, one type of timber might be a lot more sustainable than another manufacturer's similar product. Um, so I can't really just sort of give very clear guidance on, on that, um, unfortunately. No, it but, sounds yeah, like just, that's yeah. your architect and designer. You really need to discuss that with them to to find out what exactly suits your purpose. I think so, yeah. But I, I think the number one thing is just aim for more insulation and some thermal mass inside the building. So the, 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 term, the terminology is insulated thermal mass, nicely insulated perimeter outer to the building and then some thermal mass inside is is going to work in most Australian climates. Here's the other thing: is it's you know it's um you know if you if we're talking about the tropics, I know you're not in the tropics, but um you know it's a, it's a different ball game in the tropics or in alpine regions or something like that. So yeah. Okay, great, thanks. I do have another question here. Um, it was to do with your car tire, um buildings uh mm -hmm. a question saying i thought car tire rubber leaches toxins over many years and better not using it as building materials is this correct uh no it's not correct um and i mean if it was a big problem what we'd find is that all the all the little particles of rubber that fly off your tires every time you drive on the road that would be causing some sort of um diabolical environmental um, issues um the um uh i mean i think tires get a bit of a bad rap because definitely when they burn they cause all sorts of toxic emissions and so um, the game we play with these um, so-called earthship homes um, is that we ensure that the tires are all sort of basically sealed away from the elements there's like water will never come in to contact with them sun like light, air, um, fire, none of these things will um, will come into contact with the tyres. And so I just see it as a great way to sort of um, lock the tyres away where they're going to do something useful and not cause environmental impacts. And there's um, a lot of studies have been done on this. Um, and in fact, quite the opposite. They've found that tyres can actually like soak up um, toxins out of the environment or out of water. So unless you're pouring chemicals like acid um, that's going to like break the tires down, then you don't need to worry about um, tires in an in an earthship tire wall. Um, 
leaching out into the environment, you should you should probably worry a lot more about um, other things you're putting into your building, like um, that have you know toxic off gassing, plywoods, carpets, glues. All these things can lead to really bad indoor air quality. And also, every time you go drive your car, um, <laughs> we're making microplastics. So yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for that. The next is, um, what is the embodied energy rating of rammed earth, which I think was on that site, your homes? Do you want me to bring up the slide again? Uh, yes, that'd be great. Thanks. All right. Just give me. It says seconds. using right. materials from the site. So. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, well, like I'm having trouble finding that, but um, uh, yeah, let's just talk in general about, um, so ideally when you're building a rammed earth wall, you'd be using the materials off the site. Like the soil would be ideal um, to make the rammed earth wall. And for an ideal soil, you're gonna wanna have the right amount of clay, the right amount of gravel, and then you usually add a little bit of cement to stabilize it and make it waterproof. And there's also some like, I don't know, silicon based additives to help waterproof it and that kind of stuff. So um, unfortunately that's rarely the case. Usually there's gonna be truck loads of material, tons and tons and tons brought to site um, with the perfect gravel and clay content soil to make the rammed earth wall. That is typically how it is done these days. and. Also, it's a little bit like, well, for the engineer to sign off on it, they want to know that they're working with a known product, which is usually straight out of the quarry. They know what it is. They know how it behaves. And to me, that's a major bummer with rammed earth because, you know, go back 100 years or 1,000 years and we were able to build long-lasting rammed earth walls without, yeah, all this modern concern over... Um, that structural integrity. So I think if you're planning to do rammed earth, you need to team up with a really um, gutsy structural engineer who's happy to sign off on, you know, maybe you do some tests with your with your local soil and make sure it's all good. And I'd kind of refer you to the Earth Building Association of Australia. That's a bunch of mud brick builders and rammed earth builders. Go join their organization and they'll, they'll help you out. Okay, well, I think that's, Pretty much it for now. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add or personal stories? Have you built your own home? Well, my personal story is that, yeah, I, I started this journey about 20 years ago. I did a permaculture course and I learned about, um, I learned about straw bale building. That was, that was my gateway drug into this world. And um, I built a straw bale house. Like I, I went and did a weekend workshop. The other thing I, I guess I haven't mentioned tonight is that, some of these materials are actually really do-it-yourself, user-friendly, fun materials. And you can organize a workshop where friends and family or complete strangers come over and help you build your straw bale wall. And all my all my straw bales went up in in the weekend. And then it just took a really, really long time to mix all the earth render and put that on the walls. Again, we ran workshops to get people to who are interested in sustainable construction and interested in learning how to build their own home. I mean, I think it's interesting that, um, uh, you know, like humans seem to be one of the few creatures on this planet who've kind of lost the capacity to build their own shelter. And now we, you know, we have all these high tech systems and materials and professional builders and architects and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, well, actually, um, once upon a time, um, you know, like I showed you at the beginning, Indigenous people had ways of building. And I feel like things like earth ships, where we're using car tires filled with earth, um, any kind of earth, um, or straw bales, they're just really DIY, user-friendly things that you can do yourself and save money, have a great time, inspire other people. And so that's a big part of my business is like inspiring people, teaching people to build their own homes. And I know it's it's sort of probably a very fringe, unusual thing to do, but I think, in, I mean, at the moment, we've got a, a tradie crisis in Australia. There's not enough tradies to go build the 
the hundreds of thousands or millions of homes the government is predicting is going to be needed to, to solve this housing crisis. It's, it's just like, well, where are these tradies coming from? So I'm sort of like, well, why wouldn't you become an owner builder? Why wouldn't you learn how to do some of these things yourself? You can save money and um, get your house built actually to pretty good quality. So yeah, maybe that's my take home message is think about becoming an owner builder and doing a bit of the construction yourself. Maybe not all of it, but definitely some of it. Hey, well, thank you for that. Um, it's been really interesting and yeah, it's opened my mind anyway to um, all the different options out there. Um, but yeah, it sounds like you really need to do your research. You do. And I think like, like I said at the beginning, it all gets locked in at the design stage. So find a good designer, find a good architect, find a good structural engineer, find a good energy assessor, build that team. And then, you know, you're going to lock in low costs instead of having all these uh, unhappy surprises later on. And I mean, maybe one last tip is go to the, your home, um, uh, what is it? .gov.au, I think. Yeah. It's on the, in the chat there. Um, and they actually have some um, standardized house plans that you can download and sort of give to your designer or architect and say, hey, let's let's start here because that then saves them a whole lot of time, saves you a whole lot of money because um, you're not starting from scratch. And that's sort of where I'm moving towards with my business strategy as well. It's like, here's just some designs we've built and we know they work and we know, you know, that's what all the big builders are doing. The problem with all the big builders is they're not really paying attention to this sustainability issue. So I think more and more people like me will just be going, well, here's, yeah, here's a standard set of plans. Um, and we know it works. We know what the cost is and um, just saved a whole bunch of money on design and engineering. Great. Thanks for that tip. All right. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise with us tonight. Um, as I mentioned, everyone, um, the webinar has been recorded. And as soon as it's available, I will send it out to everyone that is registered for tonight's talk. Also, don't forget, we have two more webinars remaining in this series. Explore Water and Greening on Tuesday the 9th of April and Finding a Sustainability Team on Tuesday the 14th of May. I look forward to hearing from those presenters as well. If you have already registered for these, we will send out more information closer to the date. But if you haven't registered yet, we'll send through the links in the follow-up email. If you know anyone who is planning on renovating or building, please let them know about these webinars. I'm sure they will find them invaluable. Thanks to everyone for attending tonight and spending your evening with us. Thanks also to Renew for helping organise and partnering with us to present these webinars. And thanks must also go to our other partner councils. And once again, thanks to Martin for sharing all his expertise tonight. All right, have a great rest of the evening. Thanks for coming. Bye.